to one side the economic framework. And I think that is very problematic and something we have to remember now as we're going into um, an economic crisis. And I think that some of those difficult discussions on, that were about economics and politics and social issues were, were things that now we got, we're, we're seeing the price because they weren't talked about in Cairo. I know that, that, that that's something that uh, I, I've put on the table we can talk about, but I think it's a, an important one to talk about right now as we are, are pushing so hard to talk about economic and financial issues. We might find that democracy, gender, and human rights language gets challenged again. So I'm not saying I have a good answer to that, but I'm just aware that Cairo didn't put the economics language and didn't manage to get the money for it either. If we could move to the next slide. Okay, then this is really where I think there were some other hitches. Um, I'm using that word lightly, it's, but it's still a very important one. And I think we heard in Marie Simonen that these are things that are being dealt with in the ways that one can um, as a bureaucracy, as a government. But how do you really get those sorts of changes happening on the ground? How do you really get the medical establishment talking about the, the, the choices of, of women? How do you get, how do you bring out self-esteem and knowledge? Now we heard about one project which was rewarding um, young Ethiopian women with goats. That's one interesting way of doing it, but there is a much more deeper thing about how do you talk about your own body, how do you talk about choice within the different cultures that you have. And at the same time, what are the types of appropriate technologies which will allow women at different life stages to talk about those choices? I mean, these are very big issues, but I think that Cairo ha and the whole agenda does have to deal with them. Because essentially what is really appropriate and what is really acceptable for different women in different contexts. And I'm still very aware, although I know it's important to do it in an in international context, that we still put people in numbers and we still talk about, um, I mean, it, 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 it's, it's the demographic approach to very uh, sensitive issues. But I think it hides, again, the difficulty of talking to those young Liberian women about what is fistula, why did that happen, how can they make changes. I mean, all of these things um, take a lot of time, and 15 years is actually a very short time when you're talking about those sorts of changes. So it's not a, a criticism of Cairo, it's just saying we're dealing with extremely complex, difficult issues, and unfortunately there isn't going to be one blueprint, w as well as it was argued in Cairo, that's going to help everybody. Okay, so next slide. So I guess I'm, I'm going to be now going on to a bit more of a controversial topic, I guess, because for me, I think that I would say that for all, all the good that Cairo was, um, and, and I would say still is, the real problem was that there were in important systematic uh, systemic inequalities in the health systems which Cairo couldn't help to deal with. Um, but those are the th issues that need to be looked at. And that's not just about seeing health systems separately, but they're within a global economic order that essentially was just not concurrent with the Cairo agenda. Um, now, I know, and I, I, I know some of the people in the room might want to, to, to tell me to be more nuanced or, or not, not be critical of uh, neoliberalism or market-oriented approaches, but essentially I think when you're talking about delivery of reproductive and sexual health and rights, uh, I haven't got that in there, for the vast majority of people, it just d couldn't work given the way we have focused on very different types of issues as development issues the development issues of trade and economics, essentially. So that the issues that Cairo was having to do, which was health, wasn't go were not going to get the money, but not, neither was it going to be seen as, as, as crucial and as um, central to the development agenda. Marie Simonen has done a very good job of trying to show how it could be, but I don't think, and you could see by that last graph, people weren't listening to that. I mean, there was less money for family planning, less money for reproductive health, and we were going HIV and AIDS, for reasons which I'd like to come into, were, were going up. So, unfortunately, the priorities of Cairo were not the priority of the overall development um, agenda. So, next issue. I, I'm just going to um, mention a few people that uh, sort of to back up that. Um, but it, Rosalind Pacheski, who is a, a, a well-known um, uh, sexual rights and reproductive health activist, she's written uh, a lot herself, she just points out that, and this is a quote from her, that there are a lot of issues around being a, enabling women to have choices. Um, and if I could just go on to the next quote. 
Firman Rao, who's a, a, a doctor in India, also is underlining that reproductive rights are linked into economic uh, context, which this neoliberal agenda has not allowed. Okay, could we move on? Okay, so let me get to my next point, which is, um, again, I was trying hard to be provocative, about the Millennium Development Goals. I totally agree that um, maternal mortality, child mortality is, is a crucial issue. Um, my concern was that the Millennium Development Goals put those things up the forefront and as a result lost the reproductive rights and sexual rights agenda. Um, it lost it for many complicated reasons, uh, political as much as anything else, but I think that was uh, a loss to the Cairo agenda. And I think it disengaged from what I would call and I'm using the word feminist very determinedly, lens of reproductive rights and health. So that it shifted away, and in a, in a sense you could hear that with Marie Simonen's talk, it shifted away from sexual and reproductive rights into health issues and ensuring women's well-being and health. It, 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 it's a very subtle shift, but it means that you're talking about, uh, let's say, women as in that, sort of, um, I would say, ob objectifying way almost, although it's not intended in that way, but inevitably you get that women are the, the poorest of the poor, they need help, they're sort of the people that need to get these sorts of things um, to them. We can deliver it, there's a technical service, there are these three things we know that work. Um, we're not actually talking about working with them in the different cultural contexts to understand what is their well-being, what is their choice, how do, you, how do you actually deal with it. There are very good reasons for not being able to do that because, as I said, it takes a lot of time. It's not just going to be a one-off project that will deliver it or a one-off document. But unfortunately, the Millennium Development Goals, CARA was 